1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to get into, um, it is a difficult chapter in some regards, but I find as you start reading scripture verse by verse and chapter by chapter, some of the things that are really controversial sometimes kind of iron themselves out because sometimes we just believe what we've been told, whether we grew up in a certain denomination or a certain faith or no faith at all or whatever. We just believe what we are told. Um, and then when we actually start looking in the Bible, we realize, huh, that's not actually in there, <laughs> or it doesn't say that, or this actually explains something that I've always wondered about, even though we've been taught maybe a certain way or it's been seen a certain way. And so I think that will happen as we go through 1 Corinthians 14 and we speak on um, tongues in particular. Um, you may have grown up in a charismatic church where tongues was very prevalent, and we'll talk about what tongues is if you're not familiar. You may have grown up not in church at all or in a denomination that tongues was not even believed in, and so it was not practiced. You may have only seen YouTube videos of people going crazy and falling over and convulsing and shaking and, and all kinds of other stuff, all right, that we, that we could throw out there. Um, whatever it is that you come from, we're going to look at what God's Word says, and I pray that he would minister to you his truth and what it is and what it's supposed to be. If you remember a long time ago when we talked about why Paul was writing this letter to Corinth, it was because someone had written him a letter previously and it asked him a lot of these different things and a lot of the problems that they were having. It asked him these questions. And so Paul is just addressing a lot of the questions of things that he has heard that has happened in Corinth and he's just addressing them to the church as a whole. Well, part of this problem, as we have seen previously um, before Easter service, is that they were putting the gifts of the Spirit above love. They were putting the gifts of the Spirit above relationships with other people. And so they were saying, look at me. I have all of these gifts, meanwhile crushing their brother and their sister under their feet, right? It became about them and not about God. And so he's, he wrote, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, to address that, he says, what? Love, 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 love. This is what li love is. It's kind. It's patient, right? It's all of these things. And he says, this is what you should desire. First and foremost, a foundation of love. What good is it if I tell someone about Christ, but I just beat them over the head, and I start an argument, and I just want to, is that done in love? And what good is it? I don't know about you, but I don't know a single person that has ever come to know Jesus through an argument. And maybe you know somebody. Maybe There can be healthy debates. I'm not saying we can't have sides and talk and be cordial with one another. That can be a good thing. But I'm talking about just a flat-out argument, right? Where there's this name calling and this, well, you're an idiot, well, you're this and that. No one has ever come to Christ, in, in my opinion, that I know about. We see in Romans that he says it's the kindness of God. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And what does repentance mean? It means change. To go, you were going one direction, and now I'm going this direction. I used to steal, and now I only not quit st stealing. I what? Give back, right? So that's what Christ does. That's what true repentance is. It's not just to stop doing something that you shouldn't be doing, all right, or doing something, start doing something that you should. It's I am stopping, and I'm turning, and I'm actually going the opposite direction. I was lying. Now I am telling the truth. I just didn't stop lying. You understand? So it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. So in this, he is now going to go in a little bit more detail about some issues that were going on in Corinth. And it has a lot to do, in this chapter, listen to this, if you're going to hear anything, has a lot to do with order. Order. We'll see here at the end of the chapter, we won't get to it today, but next week, Lord willing, is that, you know, God is not the author of confusion. And there needs to be a certain order that happens in the church. And what was happening is spiritual gifts were in, and that is a great thing. And they, they were using them, and they were using them in a public gathering like this. But imagine if you had 10 people in a room, all right, and every person wanted to say something. You might be able to get through that in your, you know, couple-hour service or whatever, your home Bible study, pretty easily, right? 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100. Well, there eventually becomes a number where it is just not possible for us to just let everyone speak something and go around the room, or we would be here similar to when Paul was teaching and that guy fell out of the window, or Peter was teaching and the guy fell out of the window. 
um, Epaphras, right? Um, and he fell asleep because Paul talked for like 15 hours or something insane, seriously. Um, I'm not going to do that to you. And so we understand that. So wherever people fall and how long services should or shouldn't be, we're not going to get into that. There still comes a point where your body needs to sleep. There comes a point where you have to stop. And it just would be impossible for everyone to get up and speak a word. It would be impossible spiritual gifts for everyone. Oh, so this person's prophesying. This person has a word of knowledge. This person, you know, wants to speak in a tongue. This person, and God's putting all these things. And so what was happening in the church of Corinth is everything was just getting out of order, so much so that no one could learn or grow in anything because everyone had something to say. And the spiritual gifts were being such a use it was causing confusion. But what did he say? Well, that's weird because they just said something that was kind of like the opposite of what they, and I don't even know this guy. Where did he even come from? He just sits in the back and now he's telling us. You understand? So there needs to be an order and a structure. And that's what Paul is going to start um, identifying and seeing here um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So let's just jump in to chapter one, uh, verse 1 here. He says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And so he's saying it is a good thing to desire spiritual gifts. He's saying that there's nothing wrong to desire spiritual gifts, but love has to be the pursuit, as we've already said. Love has to be the main goal. And this is how they should function in the church body and life. He's going to focus on how these gifts are going to function in the church body and church life. And he specifically picks up two here, tongues and prophecy. And how can we, in the midst of these things, keep the focus on God? You know, even with our worship and even with other things going on, how can we keep the focus on God as we're here at church as much as possible? Because there's a lot of things that we could do. There's a lot of things that other churches do that, in my opinion, can take the focus off God and puts it on programs or things that... In the ends, may feel good, but may not help the person spiritually whatsoever. And so how do we keep the focus on God? And this is what he's going to talk about. So what does it mean for someone to prophesy? Well, we'll talk about this here for a second. Um, many, you know, who believe that these miraculous gifts no longer exist, just take this word prophecy as um, the word to preach. All right? But it's really difficult for someone um, to, if you read it in its original language in Greek, to really say that because there was a word for preaching and teaching, and that's not what Paul used. He used a totally different word. And so when we see prophecy, it has a lot to do not just with inspired teaching, but its, it's focus and its thought is so much more in a, in a prediction or revelation, right? It's, it's foretelling or it's forthtelling. All right, it's something that God has maybe spoken to someone, and now I feel I'm supposed to share it with the body, and it's from God, right? Similar to maybe a word of knowledge. Oh, and then there is the predictive part where we kind of think um, most time of prophecy through the Bible, it's predictive, it's predicting something. Well, you know, you read through the prophets in the Bible, and there's a lot of times that they didn't even really know what they were saying, what it meant. They knew what they were saying. But they didn't really know what it meant. There's so many prophes uh, prophecies that we look through the Word of God in the Old Testament that it only makes sense now that it has happened. And that's the way Revelation is going to be. It's great to study Revelation, guys. It's great to talk about um, the end um, of the world in a, in a good light, right? Not in like a doomsday or light per se. It's great to understand what eschatology is, which is a study of end times and what we see in Revelation in the book of Daniel. But listen to me. A lot of people have a lot of books and a lot of theories. Well, this, this symbol there in Revelation represents, you know, the Middle East, and this represents America, and this, blah, blah, blah. And everyone has an idea. And sometimes you're looking at like, man, that, that could fit. That could work. But, guys, I'm telling you, until it happens and we sit on the other side of this, there's a lot of those prophecies in Revelation and Daniel where we'll sit back and be like, ah, it is so clear now. It is absolutely this, Right? Now we see in a mere dimly, right, as we've talked about previously, we see little bits and pieces, and that's great. It's great for us to pray and think about this. But at the end of the day, prophecy is always clearly seen after it is given. And so it has to do with foretelling or foretelling of God's word and what he desires to speak to people. Pre preaching is essentially a merging 
of the gifts of teaching and exhortation. Okay, that's what preaching is. It's not necessarily prophecy as someone would try to describe here. So, we'll keep going on. Verses 2 through 3. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So, he's saying, hey, there's gifts of tongues being used a lot here. But I want you to focus more on the gift of prophecy. And now he's going to give us the reason why. And he's going to talk quite a bit in chapter 14 about tongues. He's going to talk quite a bit about it. But he's going to tell us why he thinks that we should be prophesying and using other gifts of edification, exhortation, and comfort to people around us other than tongues. And the first point he sees here is that he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Tongues, all right, the spiritual gift of tongues is meant to be spoken to God. And that's, if you remember anything about tongues, remember that. It is meant to be spoken to God. It is not meant to be spoken to men and women and boys and girls. It's not meant for that. It can serve a purpose if it's an interpreted, right? But it's not meant. It is meant for God. It's meant to be offered to God, not to me. If you disregard this, this principle, it leads to so many misunderstandings and misuses of the gift of God. It's not communication man to man. He's given us language for that, guys. He's given us several of them, actually. Hundreds of them, right? Across the world. And so when we speak in a tongue, it is meant for him. If we misunderstand it, we misunderstand Acts chapter 2, if you remember what happened. Right? Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out. Everyone heard them speaking in their own language. But you remember what they heard in Acts chapter 2, verse 11? It says, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. They didn't hear them going around, hey, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you believed in Jesus? You crucified him, you idiot. Like, you know, they didn't hear them speaking to men. They heard those men who were speaking in tongues when the Holy Spirit was poured out, speaking to God and praising his awesome name, but the miracle that was happening was that they were actually hearing it in their own languages. And there were several people groups. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, I forget how many, uh, how many I think it was five. There was at least five different languages that were there spoken, but every single one of them heard in their own language, even though they were speaking in this tongue to God. It wasn't to men. If we misunderstand this, when someone interpret, tries to interpret a tongue and addresses his or her message to men, then we know there's something off, right? There should be, if there's a tongue and it's interpreted, it should be something that is praising God, that is talking about his works. It's going to be communication to God. So if ever, anyone, someone's speaking in a tongue and then there's an interpretation and it's something that's addressed, this church I am very happy with and you guys are great and so... You all get bonuses or something, you know, I don't know, whatever, right? Like, if you hear something that's addressing to people, to men, then you can say, that's not of the Lord. This tongue is very possibly, most likely, not of God because a tongue is addressed to God. If we misunderstand this, we can be led to believe the gift of tongue is just the ability to speak another language. And all Paul means here is interpreting the preacher's sermon in someone's native tongue. But no one needs to interpret the preacher's sermon for God's sake. You understand? Because if I'm talking to God, and that's what the prayer language is, this tongue is to God, God doesn't need an interpreter. He doesn't need you to, oh, what was that? I don't really know. I don't get it. You understand? So when we misunderstand what, to uh, understand what tongues are, then it throws us into all kinds of problems, thinking that we need this to be interpreted. Because some think it's just, oh, well, you're just speaking in a language that you don't know. And oh, and it has kind of this Spanish dialect or this Polish dialect or this or this or whatever. I can hear this Arabic in there, all this type of stuff. And they try to, you know, listen to it. And <clears throat> there's been studies done on people speaking in tongues. And they've come um, to a conclusion that um, they're just speaking gibberish, that they can't understand it. 
I mean, seriously, and guys, that would, if that lines up with the word of God, if it is a language to God that only we don't know and only he understands and can only be interpreted through also, also the supernatural of someone interpreting it, then it makes sense that no one understands it because you're not supposed to because it's a language to God. That's the whole point of it, right? So the idea that it's another language or some kind of other dialect or lost language of something um, I think you have a huge problem when you read this verse because it's supposed to be to God. And if we miss, uh, sorry, if we misunderstand this, we can misuse the gift of tongues, using it in a way that draws unnecessary attention to ourselves. God does not give anyone the gift of tongues for the direct sake of others, right? Although if it's interpreted, it can be. He gives it for that person so they are directly edified between themselves and God. And that's it. And so that's what he's, he's going to focus on here. So we'll, we'll see more about this. <clears throat> because this is a simple statement, it is so devastating to the idea that tongue is just a human language and spoken for human benefit. There has to be something miraculous in it because it is a spiritual gift. And he goes on and he says right there, remember, for no one understands him. That normally when someone spoke in tongues, no one else could understand him. The reason is simple. With the gift of tongues, the attention is to speak to God and not to man. Therefore, it is fine if no one understands him, right? He says there can be an exception if no one understands him. If, if it's publicly interpreted, then it can be a, a good thing that is interpreted, and now people can understand him, and they can be edified. But we'll talk about that here in a little bit. He says, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries, we, we, we can't understand, as I already said. Like, we can't understand it. They studied it. They look, oh, it's just gibberish. Well, yeah, of course it is. It, it should look like that because he what? In the spirit, he speaks mysteries. He doesn't know. She doesn't know because of it's a language that's supposed to be directly communicated to God. Now, this doesn't mean that all intelligible speech is a legitimate gift of tongues. Some not understanding the gift may imitate it or fake it just to prove something, right? They just start, blah, 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 you know, whatever, and they're pretending something or, and just faking it because we can't understand it, because we know it, it would also make it easy to fake. Well, here's the point, is that who cares if they're faking it in their own personal time with God because that's between them and God. No one else is, there's no one to impress. You think they're going to, you know, impress God? When people fake it, they fake it when? When they do it in front of men and people so that they think, I am a more spiritual. So that's why Paul is emphasizing, listen, the, the gift of tongues is more for a private communication between you and God. On the occasion that it happens publicly, there should be an interpretation. If there is not an interpretation, it is very possible that what is spoken is not from God. Your other option would be the person who had the interpretation, you lack the faith to maybe step up and say what it was. But that's how it would. If anyone got up and spoke in tongues in this room right now while we were in service, I would leave room for an interpretation. Does anyone have an interpretation? And if no one had an interpretation, I'd say, hey, thank you for sharing, but I want everyone to know that's very possible that what they just said may not be from God, or someone here had the interpretation and you, they didn't you know, step up and speak it out loud because they were embarrassed or whatever it would be. And then I would just move on, and I would leave it at that. And that brings an order, and it brings a place where hopefully that person stood up in faith and did it, and maybe someone didn't over here, and we leave it, and we let God be glorified because whatever was just said was before that person and God. Right? And if there's interpretation, we have to trust that the Lord didn't give it to us for a reason and for a purpose or is growing somebody or teaching somebody or whatever else that it would be. But he who prophesies, right, speaks to men. So in contrast with the gift of tongues, he's going to kind of switch. We'll go back to tongues a little bit later. He's going to switch. Why do I want you to prophesy? Because I'm speaking to men. It's speaking a language that people can understand. God is directly speaking through this person to us, through obviously his word, of course, but sometimes, maybe something that has, someone has on their heart that God is just impressing upon them. I just really feel glad that I'm supposed to share this and hope this encourages and exhorts someone, and then they share it, right? And that could be understood. 
And it's not a negative thing. It is a positive thing. Look at what he says. He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Prophecy is largely a positive thing. So if you have someone who keeps prophesying, but it tends to be doom and gloom, and how horrible you are, <laughs> and how big a sinner you are, it's very possible that it's not from the Lord. Because right here we see prophecy what? Edifies, exhorts, and comforts. Now sometimes when I'm told I'm doing something wrong, it could seem like that's not edifying, right? But if it's done in love, that is actually edification. But there's a big difference between pressing someone down and then speaking the truth to someone to try to help lift them up, right? Big difference in the heart of those two things. So this should be a largely positive thing. It exhorts, it comforts, and it edifies a person. Verses 4 and 5, as he continues this thought, he says, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues. So he's seen right there, it's not a negative thing. He's not saying, stop speaking in tongues. I wish all of you did, right? But even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. Unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive the edification. So if there's an interpretation, it can be a good thing. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Well, what's he talking about here, Brendan? Paul is simply again stating the nature of the gift of tongues. Since he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, it follows that it is a gift primary for self-edification between you and God. The idea of I'm in prayer and I'm seeking God and I, I just don't know what to say. Lord, I don't even know how to pray for this person. And then you, you trust in faith and you step out and you, in your prayer time, you speak this language, this word, this gibberish, whatever, but you're trusting in God's heart that he's hearing, and all of a sudden, this, the, the presence of the Lord, you feel it, and there's this communication, and there's like this burden released off of your chest, and you just can't describe it. That's for self-edification between you and God. No one else can feel that or sense that if you would speak that, and it wasn't interpreted for everyone else to understand what was going on. So you edify yourself, and not in a bad way, in a good way. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Because why? Everyone can understand it, so therefore everyone is built up. Everyone. So even though he seems to kind of be coming down on tongues, as I already said, he's not, right? I wish you all spoke with tongues. He was positive about this gift. Paul wrote in um, here that, I think, my God, I speak in tongues more than all of you in verse 18. The passage shows that Paul also wanted other Christians to speak with tongues. So this is a good thing to desire. Don't just, well, Brandon, I don't even want to desire it since I should desire prophecy more, right? No. He's getting ready. To, he's talking about a, a public setting versus a private setting. They're, they're equal gifts of what God wants to do in our lives and how to use them. But when we are in a public setting, if everyone here is just speaking in tongues, it's supposed to be directed to God. And then there's no interpretation. No one's encouraged. No one's edified. Everyone's just like, that was super weird. Yeah, that dude's a weird person anyways. You know, like, uh, you don't get anything of it. But when someone stands and they prophesy and they say some encouraging word that God's put on their heart or scripture or something that God's putting on their heart and they share something like, man, that was powerful. That was me. And you're speaking to me. I don't know if you remember, it was a few weeks ago that, um, I don't think Luis is here, but, you know, he felt led that he's supposed to come down and pray and pray for someone. And it might have been awkward for the moment because he was leading worship and he went down and, you know, he prayed for someone and, he, and, and the Lord used that in a, in a great way in that person's life and in Luis and so forth and so on. I know he's felt led to give Carlos a hug and I know Carlos was encouraged as well and different things that were going on. And it may seem kind of awkward in the moment and the time, but that was a good thing because it was edification and there was encouragement and people understood. Those people that he went to and they talked and prayed with, there was something going on there in the spirit, even though we on the outside didn't quite understand, right? So that would be similar to a gift of tongues in the sense of like a few people were edified, right? But prophecy in particular, when it's spoken out loud publicly, can edify everybody. So there just has to be an order. We just can't go around. I just can't come step off the stage all the time and just, oh, I, started, I feel led to pray when I'm supposed to be up here teaching and I only get to pray and talk with like five people. Oh, I have a word for you, a word for you. And then the rest of you sit there like, well, 
I guess Brandon doesn't love me as much as he loves these other people or something. Or maybe I guess God does it because God's speaking through him. You understand? So there has to be an order that happens in the midst of that so all could be prophesied. If we had a, a time set aside, and I've talked with Luis about doing this, a, a time where we could have once a you know, month or you know, every other month a time of worship and an afterglow time where we can on Sunday night maybe come and we just worship the Lord and we have the lights off and we just pray and we seek the Lord with kind of no agenda. God, we just want the gifts to be used in a orderly still way, but this is the time we're leaving for that. We want that to happen. It could be a great thing, right? But people are being edified and encouraged, and there's nothing weird or strange about that because God is moving, and it's not men trying to please men, but it's men seeking and women. And when I say men, it's in the human sense, um, seeking God. I'm oh, sorry. Must be a short in there. So why would Paul wish that we all spoke in tongues? As I've already said, because it's a specific prayer language between you and God, it can unburden your soul in ways that you can't express in any other natural or emotional language that we trust that God will hear us. But even more, that you prophesy. Why? Because he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And the focus here is that the church may receive advocation more than the individual. Because we're here as a body together. It's not me and you in a discipleship or you and a group of four ladies counseling each other or whatever it would be, right? There's just a difference. And here there may be, what, 70-ish people or something here right now, 80-ish? I mean, it'd be different if the church was 500, right? 600. 5,000. How much more order has to be established in a church of that size when you're corporately gathering so there can be order? Not that you want to quench the spirit and leave God out, but there has to be some order, or I'm guarantee you out of you know, 5,000 people, there's at least one crazy person out there that would love just to have all the attention on them and will love to stand up and shout every service and go on for five hours. And then you know, everyone's like, well, I'm out. Now the church is five people because everyone left because this person is talking all the time. We get it. There has to be an order without limiting the Spirit of God. And this is my favorite. I, I, I put uh, asterisks by things, and I got five of them on here. Five stars. Five. Paul in context in 1 Corinthians 14, this is a quote from David Guzik. He says, it's more focused on what the Corinthian Christians do when they come together as a church than on what they do in their own devotional life. There are things that are fine for a Christian to do in their own devotional life which may be disruptive or annoying or self-exalting for a Christian to do in a church meeting. All right? And you can come from different charismatic backgrounds and some things may be more kosher or okay in certain, thing, in certain cultures and areas, and I, I get that. But there still comes a point where there are things that what you would do in your private devotion is may not what God wants you to do in a public setting with everyone else because you want to be concerned about others around you because there may be believers or unbelievers that come to the church and then they see you being a nut job and they have no, they just like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. This guy is falling on the ground convulsing and all that and I have a lot to say about that anyways, but nonetheless... It turns people off. And I'm not saying we limit God, but we are aware of other people. And so if you're in devotion life, you like to pray in your underwear, that's awesome. Praise the Lord. And somehow you just feel freer to worship God in your nakedness before the Lord. I'm naked and unashamed because of Jesus. That's great. Just don't do that here. All right? Don't come here and do that. I will ask you to leave in the most loving possible way. All right? And I think that's a funny thing to say, but we get the, uh, the, we get the understanding. It may not be something like that, but it may be something um, a little different, a little close to home that we just have to be careful. We have to be very careful with that we don't want to distract from what God is doing in a public setting. So even though prophecy may be better for a public setting, he says here that maybe tongue could be the greater for an individual devotional setting, Right? But again, the focus is on him. Verse 6, as we start climbing through here. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you by either revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? So 
basically, if I come to you in a tongue and you don't understand it, isn't it better if I come with words that are from God that can be understood and obeyed? I mean, obviously, that's way better. What good is it for me to go and sit in a classroom to learn math or, or, or science or whatever it be, and I don't speak the language? I'd be better off watching YouTube videos, right? Seriously, in my own language, because I will understand nothing. Nothing, unless I am trying to learn the language or something of that nature. Verse 7 through 9, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So likewise, you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand or language to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? for you will be speaking into the air. So he's just giving an analogy to repeat everything I just said. And this is one reason why I love Paul, is because I do the same thing. I just repeat the same thing over and over. Hopefully it gets into your brain so I can relate to Paul. He's just giving you the same exact analogy. You got some flutes, you got some harps. They all have a specific tones and specific notes, and when they're in unison and they're played correctly, they make a melody. They make a song, and people enjoy it. But there are times when children, they get a hold of the piano, and they think it sounds the greatest. Or they get a hold of the drum. And they think it sounds great. But to everyone else's ears, it's like, uh, let's turn that down a little bit. Let's get you lessons, right, you know, type thing. If you want to do this, that's fine. Let's get you lessons. Because just like they can't be understood when certain notes are played or not played or off key or off pitch, it's the same thing if you're speaking in a tongue and no one can understand you, then how can they obey? How can they follow God if they have no idea with what's being said? So, simple enough there. Verses 10 through 11. They are, uh, sorry, there are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world. Eh, we know that for a fact. And none of them is without significance. Also true. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Yes? That's simply understood. If I don't know the language, if I don't know German, if I don't know Spanish, if I don't know French, and you're speaking to me in those things, I'll be a foreigner. If you don't know uh, English, then I would be a foreigner to you, vice, vice versa. So they all have significance. All languages are very important to the people that understand them. But if they are not understood, then they're of little value for me. And we're not belittling people, you know, by or anyone's language, but it's just the fact that it's little value of me for me if you're trying to give me directions on how to do something in another language and I don't understand it. It's little value. Again, I would be better to, you know, watch YouTube videos or research things and try to figure it out for myself if I can't understand the language. So although languages are very important, it's just as important that they are understood. Right? So they can be properly interpreted instead of saying, you know, you ask, oh, where's the men's bathroom? Oh, blah, blah, blah. and then, they, oh, you misinterpret men's and women's, and you walk into women's, and then, you know, be in all kind of an uproar. Well, maybe not today's society, but used to anyways. And we have all kinds of problems. So language is very complex, and it exists as whole systems, and it's an amazing thing and very important. But it still has to be understood. It still has to be understood. Verses 12 through 14. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. The goal here, right, is for edification of the church that you can seek to excel. The goal must be a mutual benefit of the church for any spiritual gift. And he's already said that with identifying that with love, right? If a tongue is directed to God, how can a legitimate interpretation be edifying to others, you may ask? Well, the same way a psalm or when you hear someone praise the Lord or plea with the Lord, or pray out loud to God, and crying out and bearing their soul to them? Isn't that sometimes edifying and encouraging? And you can bear that brother or sister's burden in a certain way? It's the same way. So even though someone's speaking to God, and there can be interpretation. As long as their interpretation is understood, it can be edifying and encouraging to me. And he gives a simple solution to the whole speaking in tongues in public. He's just like, hey, Buddy, if you have the gift of tongues, why not just pray 
that you can interpret them as well. That way, when the Spirit puts something on your heart, you don't even have to speak in tongues out loud. You can just speak the interpretation. Wouldn't that be so much better? Then we won't have to wait for anyone to interpret. We won't have to wait. Was that from God? Was it from not, not from God? You just, are, oh, okay, Lord, I have the interpretation. Lord, I thank you. You're so good, and you are faithful, and thank you for what you've done, and so forth, so on. And you're praising the Lord. And now everyone can understand. He says, that's, that's a simple solution to this. But he says, my spirit prays, but my, my understanding is unfruitful. Speaking in tongues communicates with God on a spiritual level, bypassing our understanding. Bypassing our understanding. My understanding does not benefit when I speak in tongues. It's unfruitful, if you, if you will, because I don't know the language. And unless I can interpret it, it is unfruitful in the sense for people around me listening to understand. And even in my own understanding, it may be unfruitful um, besides the fact of just trusting and that I'm pouring out to God and so forth and so on. And I think this is what's hard for some people to understand because people will be all over the map. You, you may be a person that relates to God more emotionally. And you may be a person that just, uh, you know, Brandon, the Bible says it, so I believe it type thing. And, and there's a good, a good thing in that, right? You may be on the other side of, Brandon, I'm just a skeptical person, and I just need understanding. So I just, I like to understand God. I like to understand these things and dive into the deep things of Scripture or whatever. And there could be a, a good side of that. And both can have their negatives because, one, if it's God is God and he's infinite, you'll never truly be able to understand him. So at some point, you come to grips with faith and the fact that I have to trust some things. On the other side, the weakness can be, well, you know, that's nice that, you know, you just believe everything the Bible says, but... Most of the world doesn't. And so when they have an argument against the Bible, it's good that you've studied and that you've known that you can answer the question um, with intelligence and thought behind it and say, hmm, that makes reasonable sense. Maybe I can believe in this God. I'm going to search it more. Do you understand? So they can both have their weaknesses. But here in particular, we need to understand that our understanding um, comes to an end no matter what you believe. At some point, it takes a faith. We can't fully understand God, and we can't grasp it in our understanding. And here's a case in point of where I may not even understand what I say to the Lord. And so in interpretation, it could be unfruitful. But yet, God is using it, and I'm trusting in Him. See, there's a big difference as we close up here between reasonable and probable. And I'm reading this book right now. Um, it's a really good book. I encourage you to pick it up. Um, it's called Cold Case Christianity. Um, it's written... Um, by this guy who is a homicide detective for X amount of years and was one of the best and yada, yada, and all this stuff. And so it's just his journey to faith of coming to, to Christ through researching the evidence and being a detective and investigating things. Really, really, really good book. But he gives a point that there's a difference between reasonable and probable. And he gives an analogy, and I'll butcher it, but if you read the book, it'll be even better, so you won't know any difference. But nonetheless... He says, okay, imagine, okay, you're in you're mowing your yard, okay, and all of a sudden you hear something that startles you, so you stop mowing, and you look at your neighbor's house. You know, that's like, I don't know, 70 feet away. And you look through, and they have a big picture window, and you see in there a man in a mask, all right, with a baseball bat, and he is bludgeoning the person in there, your neighbor, to death. Sorry to be gruesome. He, he's killing this person. So... You're freaking out. You call the police. The person comes out, all right? You get a look at them, but you can't see their face. The police come. You're giving them your statement. They find no for forensic evidence, no hard physical evidence, no DNA, no nothing, let's just say, okay? So all you have is circumstantial evidence. And so one is this eyewitness who has the, the build and the shape of this person and saw them running. They know the time, all of these things. Okay, so now you start looking for suspects. You, you know, start looking into, oh, well, she just had a boyfriend and they just broke up and it was a nasty breakup. You start interviewing more people and you find out, well, hey, this boyfriend, um, yeah, they, they were seen fighting the night before. So they were fighting the night before. You ask the eyewitness the build and the shape and everything, and the person fits the build and the shape and everything of the person they saw running out. Well, can you say, oh, this person absolutely did it at that point? Probably not, but you got a good suspect. 
So you start digging a little deeper, but all circumstantial evidence, and you start digging deeper, and you realize that, hey, what kind of boots was they wearing? And the person remembers, oh, well, I remember exactly what kind of boots they are because they're this very rare hiking boot and whatever, and blah, 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 and you can only get them at this certain store in, the, in town and all this. So they go, and they find, like, hmm, there's only 10, 10 boots that have been sold here in this area, and guess who's on the list? The boyfriend is on the list that had one of those boots. Starting to look a little bit better, but can you absolutely prove, and as a jury say, with that evidence, throw this guy away for the rest of his life? Probably not, right? Because it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. It's probable that he did it, but it's not reasonable. It hasn't gotten there yet. So he goes on, and he just keeps going with more and more until eventually he's like, you know, he saw the car that they were driving. The lady saw the car, or you saw the car driving away, and it was this Volkswagen, and so forth, so on, and there's only two registered in the county, and guess who owns one of them? The boyfriend. You talk to more interviews, and the fr a friend comes forward and says, hey, last night I went over to my buddy's apartment because I knew they had a bad breakup, and I went and I found a suicide note there, and it details all of this stuff that, you know, he was angry and mad about. Then you get a search warrant, and you go in, and you find the baseball bat. It's been cleaned off. There's no evidence on it, except for you see some dings and different things on it. But there was a baseball bat that was kind of hidden in this place where you didn't want people to see it. Right? At some point, even though we have no physical evidence that this guy did it, you can probably say, with all that circumstantial evidence, it's beyond a reasonable doubt that this guy is it and we're throwing them in jail, right? I think with that much evidence, you could, you could do that. And that's the difference between reasonable and probable. Is it possible that that dude was just super unlucky, just happened to own those pair of shoes, just happened to have the other car, just you know, all of those things fit the eyewitness description, happened to have a baseball bat? Yeah, it's possible. But is it reasonable? Is it probable at that point? Probably not. And so just for us, when we have an understanding of God and, and who he is, and even with these tongues and different things, we may not have all this physical evidence to show people or even our own life. But it is reasonable because of all this other circumstantial evidence that is going on and the things that we see that we could talk about for a very, 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 very long time and say that, yes, God is real, God is true, and in particular, these tongues that I'm speaking are real and legitimate because of who he is. As we close up, a few things that we can look at to say tongues are not. It doesn't happen as just one opens their mouth and God takes over their tongue. God just doesn't take over. And that's why I have a big problem with the convulsing on the floor and other things, and, and, and laughing uncontrollably. Holy Spirit, laughter, I just can't stop laughing. I'll help you stop. <laughs> Boom, done. Holy Spirit, power punch. You know, <laughs> the, the Holy Spirit made me punch you, man. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. That's so, such a ridiculous thing. Guys, can you truly have faith? Can you truly have faith if God just comes and takes control of you? You can't. You cannot have faith if you are out of control of whatever's happening. Do you think that Paul just fell into some kind of trance and just woke up and like, oh man, the, book of, the, the, the letter to the Corinth, church of Corinth just wrote itself. I don't even remember doing it. Like I passed out or something. No, they were in direct control of things and God naturally, supernaturally used them to do things. The prophets that went around to, to prove it, look at the life of Jonah. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was running away from God. He knew what God called him to, and he said, I'm not going to do it, and I'm running the other direction. He got swallowed by a fish, and he remembered every bit of it. And then when the Ninevites and the Assyrians repented, he was ticked because he didn't want them to repent. He wanted God to burn them all down, and then he was mad at God. He knew everything he was doing. He knew everything that he was saying. God just didn't take control. And it's no different with tongues or prophecy or any other gift that the Lord would give us to, to fall into a place where, oh, they just took over, and I couldn't control myself. Oh. Huge red flag. I, I'd like to see that in Scripture somewhere. It doesn't happen as they begin to wiggle their tongue and God takes over. It's kind of the same thing. It doesn't happen as they are told to repeat nonsense words or phrase faster and faster and until God takes over. That's not how it happens. 
The language of tongues works much like the languages we understand. A word or sound occurs to our mind and we vocalize the word or sound. In the gift of tongues, one simply continues to speak the words and sounds coming into their mind, trusting, here we go, trusting God is prompting them and he understands what they say. And that in the spirit we say is perfectly appropriate for the moment. And that's why it's usually for your prayer closet, if you will, for the time between you and God. Because hopefully you're not trying to impress God. There may just be this time where you understand God as much as you can. You understand God as much as you can, and just through the reading of Scripture, your study or whatever, where there just comes this point to where, God, I, I want to go even deeper with you and my, my prayer time with you. And it goes past understanding. And you say, God, Give me this gift of tongues. Help me speak to this in a, in, in a place to where it goes past my understanding to you that I could relieve this burden, I could grow more in you. And in that place, as you open your mouth and you trust the Lord and faith meets your words and your actions and you're in control of everything you say, you're trusting that God is giving you the words to say to speak to him. And can you identify that? Can you say, well, without a shadow of a doubt, I would say no. The only thing you could do is trust the Lord and then that peace that passes all understanding that, man, after I prayed, I don't know what I said. But I do know, and I don't want to base things off feeling, but I do know that what I felt in the presence of the Lord, I feel this peace and this relief as I was trusting with God. If you continue to ask for that and you just start speaking all this gibberish and you're, and you're trusting that the Lord, but nothing really changes and, and it's just like, I don't even really know, then I would probably say it's probably not the gift of tongues. But if you sense something in the peace in your heart and that God is moving and working in your prayer time and in your closet, you start seeing answered prayers and you, these things like, man, Lord has given me this gift to be able to do so, to speak to him and encourage me in such a way as I speak to him. And the last thing I would say, as I have more notes, but we won't have time. The Holy Spirit does not make us do strange things and bizarre things. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32, you see it down there a little bit later, right? And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The idea is that this, the spirit of what the Lord has given them is subject to that person, right? The Holy Spirit is God, but there is a sense in which it is subject to us as we can quench the Holy Spirit, we can grieve it. It doesn't make us to do anything, Right? We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can press it down. We can choose to disobey because we have a free will. So in that sense, it's subject, not in the sense of that it's inferior because it's God. And so don't think that it's strange. And when you start seeing strange things, question it. Go back to Scripture. Challenge those people. Hey, I was just wondering, I, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, what was it that you were saying? And what, it, well, what do you think about the verse here? It says it should have interpretation and just... Listen to them and talk with them and see what God would speak um, in the midst of the situation. We may not understand everything that goes on in our life. We may not everything that happen, understand everything um, in the gifts of the Spirit, specifically tongues. But again, that's where faith comes in. And that's what our faith is, is we don't understand, but we have a, a reasonable doubt, so I, a most likely scenario because of all of this evidence. It's not a blind faith. It is a faith that has substance. It's a faith we can talk about. It's a faith we can talk about, whether we're talking about biblical, the biblical accounts, we're talking about archaeology, we want to talk about history, you want to talk about the manuscripts, the number of manuscripts that we have for the Bible is loads more than any other written piece of ancient antiquity in the history of the world. I think Homer's Iliad is the, 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 the closest thing to it, and Caesar's Gallic Wars, and it's, they're like um, a few hundred. I think Homer's Iliad is like six or 700 manuscripts. The New Testament alone has 5,000 manuscripts in Greek, the original language, even though they're copies of copies, right? And then in other languages, we have another 15,000, 20,000 manuscripts that this gets interpreted to you right here. So I think it's pretty solid that we can have reasonable evidence that this is exactly, we're super close to the originals of what God had for us. 
And out of the 400,000 variants that people say, mistakes they want to call them in the Bible, 400,000 variants in the Bible, which means like there might be a different word here or a different spelling, so forth, so on. They say, oh, there's 400,000 of them. Well, did you know only 1% of those, only 1% makes actually any difference in what it is saying. And in the places where those 1% exist, it doesn't change any doctrine or context of anything crazy that would change the Christian foundation. Most of them are misspellings. Um, they copied the line twice because they were copying, they accidentally copied the line twice or the word twice or so forth, so on. It changes nothing about is this true or is it not true. But as soon as someone tells you, oh, there's 400,000 mistakes. Oh, my gosh, I don't even know what to say. Well, now you know. Look it up. There's only 1% of those that actually have any validity to changing what this says. And out of that, none of those in question change any major doctrine or anything of the Christian faith.